Aloha and welcome to the NFLRC Selecting and Adapting Materials for Online Language Learning and Teaching webinar. This project is funded with support from a grant from the US Department of Education. We are very happy that you've decided to join us and we welcome you and appreciate your time. So we'll go ahead and jump right into our first session. And to do that, I want to introduce Catherine Murphy Judy. Dr. Catherine Murphy Judy, PhD has been involved in technology enhanced and computer assisted language learning since the 1970s. In 1997, she edited Nexus, the convergence of language teaching and research through technology. And in 2007, co-edited preparing and developing technology proficient L2 teachers. She is currently co-authoring a guidebook to the online language design and delivery due to appear in 2020. She has created video discs, hypermedia, interactive CD-ROMs, websites, blogs, wikis, and is currently co-authoring an intermediate OER e-textbook with students and colleagues. Her work has long pioneered student digital literacies and autonomy, as well as teacher professional development. She is a tenured associate professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University in the School of World, Study, World Language Studies. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Murphy, Judy. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so very much, Sarah. And I really want to thank Julio and Russ and everyone at the National Foreign Language Resource Center for inviting me to do this today. Um, I started putting it together last week, so some parts of it may be a little bit rough, but um, by and large, we got a lot to get through, so I'm gonna zip on through. Um, I put our targets today, what, what our learning goals are in uh, can-do statements, since that's sort of the uh, sine qua non of our field. So what we'll be looking at is um, being able to say at the end of this that I can define what self-directed learning is. I can imagine what a self-directed learner looks like and acts like. Uh, I can define self-directed learning for me, my students, and my, um, and my students. I can follow uh, the QFT strategy, which we'll take a look at pretty soon, that's the uh, question formation technique to guide learners for selecting and using self-directional materials. And I can use curation as a way for students to find and adapt online resources that will allow them to become more self-directed learners. So quite a bit to do. And let's start with a few questions. And the first question is, which one, and I'm going to take you to a page here, which is this bit.ly. Um, and if you could go to this bit.ly, which is NFLRC SDL1. If you could go to that, then what we're going to do is take a look at images of some potentially self-directed learners and kind of talk about which one you think best represents for you what a self-directed learner looks like and how they act. And then in one to three, whoops, one to three sentences or labels, they don't have to be sentences, just, uh, you know, like uh, hashtags, why you think that this is an image of a self-directed learner. And so here are just a bunch of different people who you might find are um, self-directed learners. You can choose any one of them there. And you can also, if you want, you can do it really quickly since you're, you've got editing capabilities, you could go up under insert and you could put your own pictures in there of self-directed learners. Well, let's, let's take a look at what we've got here. And if you wanna keep putting some things in, you're welcome to. What's really important is um, that I put out there first, there are no right answers, there are no good answers, no bad answers, or they're, they're just um, your thoughts and your thoughts are your thoughts and they're, and they're, they're yours. So under Hetty Lamar, which um, 
I was always really interested to find out that she was an amazing scientist because of course Hollywood just cast her as uh, one of the dazzling women of Hollywood. Um, but under here, why she would be um, a self-directed learner, it, it, very true scientists by nature are self-directed. They follow a process for getting things done and answering questions. So process is a really important part of it, but also scientists are framed by their discipline to think in certain ways and to be able to um, ask questions based on what they're looking at. In fact, that's one of the uh, parameters of being a, a scientist is to look at the world and then start asking questions about why it is the way it is. Katherine Johnson, who was uh, one of the people showcased in Hidden Figures, definitely tenacity, super important for self-directed learners, love of her field. She loved math. Um, she was undaunted by adversity. Driven scientist, persistent, lifelong learner, certainly, because she started uh, started to go to West Virginia University and then ended up not finishing, but then came back and finally ended up getting a PhD, never gave up, focused on her goals, overcame lots of resistance. Uh, Malala Yousafzai, um, as well, internally driven, positive attitude toward her work, got a lot of support from the West, a bit less from Pakistan motivated to share and learn from others. And I love this one. She focused on the necessities of her society and did her best to get young girls educated as she had experienced self-learning herself. Uh, Simone Biles, the gymnast, created new standards. I mean, she really pushed herself and the field um, toward new heights set her mind to accomplish things that had never been accomplished before without saying, without limiting herself. Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, persistence, goal-oriented. Um, he's someone who never finished college. He started at, at Harvard and was working um, on what eventually became Facebook and um, realized that he could self-direct his work and achieve what he needed and wanted to outside of a classroom, outside of outside of normative education. Um, and he definitely has and continues to put given norms into question. Low affective filter, definitely. Uh, the children, they're showing grit. They're, they're using a, a device without people, without adults helping them to do that. And they're sharing each other's knowledge together. They, they've got curiosity, natural desire to explore. They're learning with technology um, in their own time and space. Um, information interests them or is, or is useful to them. Um, it's teamwork. The child down here who's reading uh, is choosing her own material. She's working at her own speed, but she knows that she's got a book and she wants to work through it. And so that's what she's doing. Albert Einstein, we know he created his own path of independent research, certainly went way beyond the bounds of physics at the time, uh, did a lot of independent research and, and synthesized mathematical knowledge, love that. Um, the hiker, I just kind of threw that one in just to uh, see who might pick up on it. And, this is somebody who's learning how to act in a situation based on personal experience or talking to other people. My daughter just got back from Alaska and she said, oh yeah, brown bears, take them really seriously. Don't mess with them. If you see them coming, move. Um, this is someone who's driven by personal motivation, not by a curriculum. Uh, the hiker is learning from real life experiences and yeah, self-defense, <laughs> probably running away and learning how to solve problems uh, immediately. I love this, um, Taha Hussein uh, grew up blind and has grown and has gone on to become the Dean of Arabic literature, has written about his childhood, uh, things that he knows, uh, grew up apparently in, in rural Egypt, but has managed to overcome quite a few things. Some more about Albert Einstein, he was a 
because maybe school was not self-directed enough for him, but uh, definitely a lifelong uh, learner with revolutionary ideas. We've, we've looked at the at, at attributes, the behaviors, uh, the dispositions, the characteristics, the frames of mind, the attitudes um, that self-directed learners have. I've put a link in here down at the bottom uh, if you'd like to see how Edutopia works with putting self-directed learning to work in your classroom, which is where I got the idea of, of picking the uh, pictures and having you uh, talk about what you were seeing and wrapping it up together with what a self-directed learner is. So if this is what a self-directed learner looks like for you, this is a framing question for us today. And that is what can we as faculty, as educators, what can we do to guide our students towards attaining some of these qualities, behaviors, dispositions, attitudes, frames of minds, so that our students can become effective 21st century self-directed language learners. And importantly, what we'll be looking at is how can we get them uh, sourcing from online to be able to help themselves in their own uh, self-directedness. So what self-directedness looks like for the learner is defining a goal, identifying the steps that are necessary to reach it, choosing learning strategies so that they can move along the path of those steps towards their ultimate goal, and knowing how to reach out and find support um, as learners, which may be regular classrooms, it may be online, it could be YouTube videos, it could be wikis, it could be um, FAQs or different um, social media groups, Pinterest, um, lots of different support mechanisms today. So the next question is, um, oops, 21st century language learners have unlimited access to opportunities to engage in self-directed language learning. What I'm gonna ask you to do is to go back to that same page that we were just on, scroll all the way underneath all of the pictures, and you're gonna write down at least two questions or as many questions as you can that this statement, the prompt, that 21st century language learners have unlimited access to opportunities to engage in self-directed language learning brings to your mind. There are no bad questions, and it's all questions. And every question that we ask that someone else asks opens up new opportunities for the rest of us to think and learn. So again, there's nothing right or wrong. Just ask questions. You may totally disagree with this prompt, in which case, go ahead and ask questions that really interrogate um, the prompt and uh, the different aspects of it. So the prompt was 21st century language learners have unlimited access to opportunities to engage in self-directed language learning. And um, the first question was actually mine because I wanted to make sure something was there. And it, frankly, it wasn't a very good question in, in my estimation, but we're not supposed to talk about what's a good or bad question. Um, but I just was like, okay, so 21st century, but what about 20th centuries? Did they have unlimited access? And you know, if you, if you start doing things comparatively, as we know um, with actful five Cs, if we look at things through communities, comparisons, uh, communication, and, and all of the different five Cs, that <clears throat> there are lots of ways to look at, at language learning. Um, is access equal across Communities. Wow, that's really, really important because we know this is not an equal access world. 
and yet there are different viable ways of getting different kinds of access. I remember when I was um, on a Fulbright in, Col in Bogota in Colombia, uh, the students did not have a lot of access to um, uh, virtual learning and so on, but they found ways to do it that uh, our students who do have a lot of access just don't have. Some other things, uh, what does it mean to engage in self-directed learning? I, we're gonna take a look quite a bit at that um, is self-directed learning always active or is some of it more passive? And I think we've seen a lot of online education where, you know, supposedly the learner is directing themselves, but it's, it's not a, a very active um, learning platform, but it can be. Online learning can definitely be very active. Uh, what, are the, what are the costs of unlimited access? What motivates people to learn? And I'm just kind of gonna zip through because we have so many questions here, but these, these are wonderful. What I'd like for you to think about right now, as we look at all of these questions that have been generated, I want you to think about the beginning of a unit that you're doing as you're teaching your language or literature or culture class if you started not by you asking questions, because we as faculty, we love to ask questions. We're always doing that. We're trying to get um, answers out of our students. But what if we really flip it? This is a completely different kind of flipping. And we get the students to ask the questions so that we know before we jump into the heart of the matter and start, you know, uh, providing our lessons and the different tasks that we want them to do and setting up the, the uh, learning adventures that they'll have so that we know what they're really interested in, so that they know what they're really interested in as far as the, the overarching topic is of the unit that we're doing. So we're here in a class. Um, where we're talking about self-directed learning and how to help our students find and use and adapt uh, different online resources to move their self-directed language learning forward. And look at all of the questions that we've got. We have really seriously already started to engage with the topic. Um, there, there's just, I mean, we've got 53 approaches to this and all kinds of really good questions. Just want you to think about using a, a strategy like this to get your students to become more self-directed so that they're asking themselves and they're asking each other the questions that are really important that have meaning and that are relevant to them today about whatever the subject area is that we're going to have them working on. Part of it is a question of what is self-directed learning and I've found lots of definitions um, but going back to 1975 apparently Malcolm Knowles was one of the first people to coin self-directed learning. Um, he describes it as a process in which individuals take the initiative with or without the help of others in diagnosing their learning needs, formulating learning goals, identifying human and material resources, and for learning, choosing and implementing appropriate learning strategies and eventually evaluating their learning outcomes. It's not autodidactism, which is, it, there are lots of different terms. There's self-directed learning and there's um, well, there, there's just a, a whole bunch, but what we're looking at is pretty much what Malcolm Knowles put there in 1975. And what I've seen throughout all of the reading that I've done is there's pretty much four steps in self-directed learning. And the first one is to assess one's readiness to learn. Now, if we're doing that as faculty um, with our students, it's uh, 
really important for them to get on board so that they're assessing whether they're ready to learn in a self-directed fashion, whether they've got the skills and the attitudes toward learning that are gonna allow them to be successful as they're directing themselves. The second step is setting learning goals and communicating the learning goals between the student and him or herself and or the student and whoever the instructor is who's gonna be working with them. Uh, the third step is to actually engage in this learning process. And then the fourth really important one is to evaluate learning. This is where reflection comes in and one looks at and has to ask oneself, did I learn this? If I didn't, or to, and to what level did I learn this? And if I didn't, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go back? How do I need to, to seek scaffolding and support so that I can uh, learn this better to the level to which I want to learn it? Um, I've pulled this out from the University of Waterloo uh, in Canada, Canada, its Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. And the link is right there. It will also be in the um, TED Ed lesson uh, that I will get put together by this weekend. So the first thing is assessing one's readiness to learn. And so what is readiness to learn? It's that entry point of the learner relative to the concept or the skill at a given time. So if it's at the beginning of a semester and the student is if they're ready for this course is one thing, but if we're already three units in, uh, there's a different time. And so they're gonna be different and different entry point into unit three than there was into unit one. Um, so to assess a student's readiness to self-direct their learning, uh, you can look at either of these and I'm trying to keep track of time because I wanna get us into actually looking at how to do source online resources. But both of these, um, these two links are very helpful for asking the kind of questions um, that learners need to ask themselves. And then there's a site, uh, Guglielmino's um, who came up years and years ago with a lot on self-directed learning. And you can actually buy their whole um, survey of uh, self-directedness and uh, you could use something like that. But by and large, the other two up above are really good. So importantly for world languages, what we wanna know is our students ready to learn self-directedly and how can they assess, assess their skills? And I'm gonna have us take a quick look at Linguafolio and the European language portfolio. Linguafolio is not the only player in this game. Um, it is a, a language portfolio that was um, actually started in Virginia, Kentucky, and I think Ohio, and is now being used by Necessful and by Actful as sort of the basis for um, an e-portfolio in languages, but it itself is based on the European language portfolio. So some of you may actually know the European language portfolio, which I've seen used in other countries um, rather than using the Necessful Actful one. The Linguafolio um, has had a lot of research done on it because it's been around for quite a few years. Um, and its use is linked to increased student intrinsic motivation, increased task value, and more accurate self-assessment of learning. And we've already seen with self-directed learning, there's a need for motivation for staying on task by because one is valuing the task and also that accurate self-assessment of learning. So it has three components. It's got a passport, a biography, and a dossier. And I'm gonna look 
more so at the biography because as you can see right here, right within Linguafolio, you have got some self-directed um, attitudes, dispositions that students need to think about. And so I organize my workspace. I check to see I have everything with me. I keep a day planner, an assignment folder. I manage my time because managing time is extremely important for self-directed learning. I have a schedule to study at specific times and complete tasks in specific times. I set goals and review them. So first of all, in the, the biography part of Linguafolio, there's a whole section on how do I learn? And then the second part is where they set up um, what they're going to learn, what the learning plan is. And this uh, is my uh, image there of, as a fake student, um, I was pretending to be a, a student who was in the 200 level uh, of a language learning class. And so you can see the inner circle, that's where the students are at the novice, and then it builds out and they, branch into the intermediate and then the advanced and the superior and the distinguished uh, levels of proficiency. And as they go through in the lingua folio biography, they are noting what they can do and they're working on what they plan to be able to do. So it's, it's a very strong way to help students um, see where they are, assess where they are, and start to plan on where they want to get in their language learning. So there's a lot of goal setting where they set their personal learning goals. And then there are also class goals. So you can use Linguafolio in your classroom to help the entire class set its learning goals and objectives through the use of can-do statements. Um, and as it shows there, Linguafolio helps learners and it helps teachers because it helps us guide the learners in setting their goals. Um, it helps us uh, help them self-reflect and self-assess and so on. So in addition to the students using something like Linguafolio online, where they self-assess their own proficiency levels and the things that they can do in the language, which is what you get both in Linguafolio and the, in the European language portfolio. There also are online, and this is somewhere where you can send your students out to say, okay, you know, if you're, if you're in a computer classroom or if you're in an online classroom, you can say, well, why don't you go and see if you can find somewhere where you can test your French abilities, your Spanish abilities, their German. And I noticed that there were a number of folks who are here who are doing uh, less commonly taught languages. Uh, so it might be Arabic or Chinese and so on. And there are online little self quizzes that you can help your students find. And I'm just gonna quickly take you to this one which is in French, because it's wonderful. It's uh, a little test that it's free. The students can take it. Um, they click on the little uh, boîte postale and it starts their invitation to do this. And, and it runs through a whole test. It has uh, listening, reading, and writing. It doesn't have a speaking part to it, but it's a pretty comprehensive little test there. And um, there are other ones that I found through the um, Cervantes and also from the Goethe Institute. The Cervantes was, was a lot more straight up grammar, but definitely we can also send the students out and say, hey, why don't you find out if you can self-assess? Uh, the about.com site in the different languages used to have a lot of assessments and in fact, that's where I found this French one at first. And I've noticed that the Canadian government 
has got some really good uh, language assessment um, routines. And so I'm sure any number of countries need people who are immigrating to the country or who are coming to live to, in the country to be able to get up to snuff in the target language, in that country's language. And so I think it's very possible to find these self-assessments to let students look at where they are and um, then get a better idea of where they need to go. All right, they need to become motivated in order to follow the plan that they have for their learning. And um, Daniel Pink, who has a book called Drive, says that there are three uh, very real internal motivations that are needed for self-directed self learning. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I'm going to go back to the, the autonomy part. Because where we started, where when we asked all of those questions about self-directed learning on that prompt, that's a part of actually allowing learners to ask their own questions, which is a really uh, strong technique to get learners invested in the learning and therefore um, motivated to continue learning because they get to ask their own questions whatever there is about the topic or the field that they can find personal interest into. And then of course, the learners need the mastery. So to go back to lingual folio, as they go through and they say, yes, I can do this and submit their evidence, um, they're showing that they can master it and they're feeling the mastery that they've been able to do this at the proficiency level that they need to be at. They're not frustrated because they're not working at a level way too high that they can't do. Um, and then he notice, notes purpose too, that uh, connecting to a greater good is uh, important for many people as they're learning something. And again, when the students get to ask their own questions, and I saw that in your questions, there were many people saying, is there truly access? You know, what are we doing here? If we're talking about self-directed learning and there isn't access, equal access for people, you know, we're connecting this whole question about what we're learning to a greater good about a bigger social, uh, political, and even individual personal uh, good that is a part of motivation. That's quickly about uh, growth mindset, which is also very important. It's a part of the mastery is that self-directed learners need to get rid of all of those labels that they're not smart, not talented, not that kind of person, but to have a growth mindset. And that self-directed learning, we need to let them know that learning a language is hard work, but that the hard work is that they put in is going to help them be able to get something really important. And they've asked the questions that have let them already see what that important set of goals are in their life. All right. So this I have taken from, um, it's the rightquestion.org. Um, and I have been following their work um, with question formulation techniques and so on, because I am finding it extremely powerful for self-directed learning. It starts with a question focus, as we did when the focus was on self-directed learning uh, in the 21st century. And then we had the rules for producing questions, which is they're all good questions. You don't have to do any kind of uh, grammatical or syntactical work on it, but let me go ahead with the other process of the question formulation technique, the how to produce the questions, categorize them, prioritize the next steps, and reflection. <clears throat> so the question focus, for us, a lot of times where we start with our students is a text to interpret. It's an interpretive mode 
or maybe it's a unit theme. It might be the unit on um, families and housing, or it might be on education, or it might be on food. Unit focus with an intercultural difference, which is something really important to um, explore. Uh, politics and media in France are quite different than they are from politics and media in the United States and are quite different from politics and media in Morocco or Ivory Coast. Um, then we can also use the five C's as a great place to start for our question focus. We can follow it with can-do statements that we want to target with our learners and the integrated performance assessments that we will be using uh, with our students to gather the evidence from them of their performance as they work through what it is that they can do and want to be able to do in the language. So um, I started with a food unit and because most of us have a food unit. <laughs> um, and what you try to do is come up that's something that's a provocative statement or a set of images, something that's gonna get the learners thinking about it. So for this one, uh, the focus uh, is traditional French culture places high priority on enjoyment of food. Sure. By law, a traditional baguette can only have three ingredients, flour, yeast, and salt, and must weigh 250 grams, just short of nine ounces. Or, same topic, maybe I use images. And these are taken from La Cuisine à Grenoble, uh, Jay's site. Um, and the reason, whoops, I have that down there that uh, you're gonna find out in the next session is about how to use uh, Creative Commons licensing. But at any rate, the students have these images and you set them loose on them and you say, all right, you have this prompt that's either a question or a statement and go ahead, ask questions. And here are the rules for the questions. Ask as many as you can. Do not stop to discuss, judge, or answer any of the questions. Write down every question as it's stated. And this is particularly if the students are working in a group. Uh, and if you have a statement that shows up, just switch it into a question. So this is what you have to do to get to launch into a unit. So then they use the question focus. They produce a lot of questions. Um, you have them thinking freely. They're not worrying about the quality of the questions. They're not looking at the grammar, the word choice, the syntax, and neither are you. Um, they're asking questions. And then as they move on, <clears throat> they've produced the questions. Uh, as they work on them together, you'll actually see the students working together to kind of clean things up but you're not doing that. You're letting them say, oh, is that the right way to do that? Is, is that the correct syntax for the question? Then you have them move into improving the question. So once they have this big long list of questions, you ask them to look, there are two different kinds of questions. There are open questions and those are the one, or the open questions are the ones that are gonna require a lot of explanation. And closed questions, close-ended questions, that you can answer either with a yes or a no or with one word. So if it's a yes, no question, the answer is gonna be yes or no. That's a, a closed one. And so then what you have the students do is go back through their big long list of questions and they start marking whether they're C for closed or O for open. And of course, you know, you can be doing this all in target language. So in French, it would be fermé or ouvert. <clears throat> and they'd be using F's and O's. <clears throat> the second thing that they do is they think about and name the advantages to asking a closed question as opposed to an open question. 
Closed questions, what are some of the advantages? Well, um, the answers are, are pretty quick to give. So you could ask it and just really quickly get an answer. But an open question, it's gonna take a lot more time. An, an open question, there might not be a right or wrong answer. There may be a lot of gray area. It may actually bring out a lot more in the topic. So you get them to talk about the difference between the open and closed questions and what those questions are gonna bring about <clears throat> uh, as they work through them and think. Then the third is they start practicing changing an open question into a closed question. Now you can see in a language classroom where they're getting an awful lot of language work going on um, because they're, they're changing from the who, what, when, where, why, how kind of questions to is it this, was it that, and so on. And I see that I've got to really move on here because we're getting way down on time. Then you have the students prioritize the questions. So they pick some of the questions that they want to work on. And that's going to allow you through the rest of the unit to really keep bringing back the things that they're working on in this unit, uh, the kinds of language that they need to answer these questions in the unit, so that it's based on what they're interested in, what they think is most important, what they think are uh, the priority questions. And then uh, after that, in a language course, you're gonna probably need to do a lot of work on having them talk about what they need to know, the skills they're gonna need in order to um, execute an interpretive and interpersonal presentational task that's based on this whole uh, set of focus questions, prompts and questions that they've got. So how have I been using this? At VCU, we've got a curations project where the students are given a focus, um, then they're asked uh, to go through and do what we've just seen in the um, question uh, formulation uh, technique. And then they learn how to curate. They curate things that have meaning and relevance in their lives. Then they engage in interpretive, interpersonal and presentational performances uh, based on their curation. And then they self-assess using can-do statements based on the evidence that they've uploaded. And then they reflect, reflect on what they learn doing that. So what does that look like? Um, say it was unit zero, uh, which is a very lengthy unit in this OER book that we're creating, where I actually have the students go out and look for things that they know they need to learn. Unit one is all about identity. And so they go out and they look for something that has to do with the qualities, beliefs, personality, and looks, um, the expressions that make a person who they are. And we kind of focus in on identity. Unit two is on communication. So it's how do you transmit and share ideas, opinions, facts, values from one person to another. And based on their questions, that they come up through the question technique, then they are better able to um, do their curation and bring that into class. So uh, the way they do the questions, they maybe on Google Docs or Flipgrid, Padlet, VoiceThread, a discussion board, they come up with all of the questions that they have. Um, in class, if you were doing it at class, they might be on paper or with iPads or digital tools like the ones just above. You can as ascribe roles to, this, to the students, timekeeper scribes, monitors, cheerleaders, leaders. Um, so this is what it looks like when my students go out after they've done their questions and they've decided what it is about um, let me see, this, this one, this is all about their futures. So that actually was unit four. And so they went out and looked at um, what they're interested 
in using the French language for, for the rest of their lives. So before I have them do that, I have a librarian come into class who teaches them how to search effectively in French. And he's built this for us, um, helps them a great deal to learn how to do searching. And then um, they learn how to curate right on the curation site. And so they have all the instructions here on how to do a curation. And that's how to use our site. I'm gonna scroll past that because that's just for us. Um, but then it allows them to post their curations, how to search effectively, select good assets, and then input them and do annotations on those. And I'll go back here. Uh, so they curate on things that have meaning and are relevant in their lives, just widely on the World Wide Web after having learned how to, to search well. And then they engage in performances that are interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational based on what they've curated in class. Um, and then they also, we use LinguaFolio for them to self-assess through can-do statements that we've set up that work for each one of the units. So they evaluate their learning using the LinguaFolio. And they do reflection, which we know is probably one of the most important parts of learning. And so I know this has been really, really fast, a lot to get through, um, but the meta reflection for us is how important is it for learners who are learning uh, self-direction to get an overview of the field that they're learning about? What kinds of definitions can we ask them to devise that will move their learning and self-direction forward? And how did you having a say very early today in the questions that needed to be asked about self-directed learning made this lesson more relevant and meaningful and therefore I hope more memorable for you? So we have just a few minutes for some questions. I know it was a lot. Um, there we go. Dr. Murphy, Judy, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. This topic is so important as we continue to see how technology will continue to grow and change and really shape how our students are learning. Self-directed learning is probably gonna become much more the norm as we continue onward. We had a few questions come up. One came up twice. While students are still on the learning path themselves, how can they know exactly where they're heading to? Um, that's where something like LinguaFolio comes in because LinguaFolio is based on the proficiency levels and it charts out for them. It helps them find where they are and then charts out what they're going to need to plan to do to learn in order to move forward in their own proficiencies um, in the interpretive, uh, presentational, and interpersonal modes. So I think um, using something like the proficiency levels and the can-do statements really helps there. Definitely, it's a great way to empower students as well so they can monitor their own progress and see how much progress they're making and continue on with the study of the language. Fantastic. 